Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today I have Brian Borstein back on. Uh, again, don't even know how many times at this point, but uh, either way, always good to have Brian on. So Brian, thanks for coming back on, man. Last time I saw you, we actually finally got to meet in person. So yeah, really glad to be here again. Always good to chat fitness with you. And it was really cool to see you in Colorado after your experience at N1 and be able to kind of rehash some of that with you. And uh, yeah, really cool to be able to connect in person, man. Now next time we'll just have to train together. Yep, I know. I was I was really hoping we could get a session in, but you were you were in Costa Rica pretty much. I mean, it actually worked out perfectly because I think you got back the Monday. That was Monday, right? And then we yeah we, Monday night, and then we hung yeah. out on Tuesday. So it was right after that, yeah, it's kind of funny that the time I was in Colorado, you were you were out, but yep. you know that's how it works out. So you also had Dave come this past weekend. Did you take him to the to the bistro? Or did you guys not make it out uh, to there? Uh, no, Dave didn't make it to the bistro. He's on a a he does these experiments, you know, at the end at the end of one experiments on himself. Like he just only trained one calf for like the last three years or something crazy like that, and so he's always doing some kind of experiment. And now he's doing a test to try and eliminate saturated fat from his diet for three months and see if that changes his LDL cholesterol. So, I mean, you can't completely eliminate saturated fat. So he was trying to keep it under like 10 grams a day, which is basically eliminating it when you think about all the different ways that you could consume saturated fat. And so if we would have gone to the bistro, I feel like that steak we had or whatever he would have gotten would have been filled with all varieties of saturated fat. So instead we... We stayed at my house. We packed food, went to the grocery store, cooked. We ordered in sushi one night because that's low saturated fat for him. And then unfortunately, the the we went to N1 and we trained, which was not unfortunate. That, that was pretty cool. But we got back from N1 and we were locked out of our house because Excel had cut our power without much warning. They gave us like an hour warning. And so we got home. We couldn't get in our house because our front door was double locked and our garage operates on electricity. So we're sitting there at like 3 p.m. on Saturday, realizing we can't get into our house and had to call a locksmith. And then the power stayed off for 48 hours. So the the end of Dave's trip was not ideal. Man, you don't you don't like realize how much stuff you use with power until you're out of it. And then you're like, holy crap. It's like how that's just the most like eye-opening experience whenever that happens. Yeah, I think the two main things were the perishable food in the fridge was really bad. And then not being able to charge devices and use Wi-Fi. Like not using Wi-Fi was less of a problem because you can hotspot. But not being able to charge devices and realizing how many devices you actually have to charge is pretty wild. Yeah, basically like everything. So were you just like charging stuff like in your car or something? Or Yeah, or I spent so many, so like 20 minutes at a time because I didn't know how safe it is to just sit in your car on, you right. know, using the power or whatever. So I'd do 20 minutes at a time and just charge up as much as I could and then go back to life. How was your guys' training session at N1? I know you guys oh, did was, like lats yeah, and chest. Yeah, it was exactly. It was lats and chest. Uh, it was really cool, man. It was a great circuit. One of the things I think we may talk about on this episode is my experience at N1 Hypertrophy Camp a couple of weeks prior. But one of the things that I've really kind of taken away from the last month of conversing with Cass and training with him and stuff is training density, which is kind of the ability to alternate between movements with say one or two minutes rest in between them as a circuit instead of taking, you know, three to five minutes rest and just doing straight sets of things. And by the time you do four exercises and get back to the first exercise, you basically had 10 minutes of rest before you get back to it. So you feel recovered, but you're able to then have achieved a ton more volume and good quality stimulus through alternating with the other movements. And so that's exactly how we designed this training session as well. We went short, short, for pecs and lat, and then we went long, long lengthened movements. And we did that for a second circuit as well. So we had four short movements and four lengthened movements, which is eight total movements across a session for two muscle groups. It's way more volume than I would usually do, but we fit it in and, you know, a reasonable amount of time. So I, I really think there's something to that. It's just potentially not as applicable to people that don't have an N1 facility to go train at where there's no members and nobody using the equipment because in a commercial gym, I couldn't imagine being like, I'm going to take up four machines at the same time. You know, I know that's always the practical limitation there with that. That's always kind of what people give me feedback on, you know, when we try to do like any superset type stuff like that is like, it's just hard to hard to do. And then like, you got to make sure you, 
the equipment's by each other and, and everything like that with the, with the volume that you guys did any soreness on your end or anything like that, that you felt from that session? No, I actually didn't even get sore a little bit. I was so surprised. I mean, to be honest, we did probably one top set to failure on each, and then maybe one set that was between two and three RIR, one to three, depending on the movement, like the short movements, we'd go to one, the length and movements, maybe two or three, but really only one final round of each circuit where we went to failure. So I probably went to failure on four chest sets and four back sets, which is in line with kind of the amount of volume that I would usually do when you specifically look at just failure points. Well, man, well, I guess kind of how we want to start off today is just kind of talk about your training. I know last time we talked when you had Jordan on, I think you were kind of in the middle of your, I mean, I know you kind of changed things up. So maybe we'll start there with your last mezzo, kind of how that went, any any findings, anything cool there with that. And then we can kind of talk about your like training that you're doing now. Yeah, the bro split turned out pretty well. It got cut a bit short due to life circumstances. So if I were to ran it, have run it all the way through, it would have been through the final week of March and into the first week of April. But I ended up cutting it short in the first week of March. So I really only got like one and a half mesocycles in instead of two. And that was because of the Costa Rica trip primarily and N1 hypertrophy camp. So in back, like I had the N1 hypertrophy camp and then a week later I had Costa Rica and I had to, you know, decrease my training even leading into the N1 hypertrophy camp. So uh, it was great though. I, I did, I did hit a lifetime PR on my hack press machine. I feel like I bring up that machine all the time because it really is one of the only machines that I do that I've been doing in the exact same manner for like a year or a year and a half straight where I do it with this two or three second pause at the bottom and the reps. If you were to look at a video of me from 18 months ago to now, like the sets, the execution is identical. So it really is like kind of a cool gauge of what's happening, at least in my lower body. And so I set an all-time PR. It was it was pretty cool. I built up to it over the course of the mesocycle. And I believe it was my prior PR was 550 for six and then five. And so I built up and I hit 550 for six and five the prior week. And then I would load it up 560 the next week. And I hit six and, and five again. So only 10 pounds and on a 500 pound total means it's like a minuscule percentage of the total. So I don't give too much credence to that, but you know, 25 plus years into training, any sort of progress that you can make like that feels like a great victory. So I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. I mean, any little bit when you're, you know, doing that much weight, you know, it's a, it's a big win. Was there anything, yeah, any other, like, did, did it feel different to train that way or was it pretty normal from that standpoint or yeah, was there anything like that with, with the, with the bro split? Yeah, it felt good. The way that I constructed it, as I've described it as the intelligent bro split is that it wasn't really just one muscle group because even though chest was on Monday, there would be a anterior delt press, which is basically like a steep incline press on the shoulder day. And so that would get a little bit of upper chest. And then at the end of arm day, I would put dips. So I would get a little bit of lower chest that way. So the chest is being hit across the week that way. Same with back, like there is a back day, but I did pull-ups on the arm day. And so you're getting a little bit of back there. I also did some rear delts on shoulder day. So you're getting a little bit more there. And then shoulders, you know, they get hit on everything. Chest day, the front delts get hit. Back day, the rear delts get hit. So shoulders uh, get hit across the week. And then arms obviously are like shoulders. They get hit on all the, the compound days as well. So the real, the only muscle groups that really truly were trained once a week were my hamstrings and my quads. And I feel like everything else pretty much was trained multiple times a week. There was just one major dose of volume and then one kind of accessory dose. And so I guess... As far as lower body goes, I never had soreness that lasted significantly long to the point where I felt like I needed a week off or a week to train it again. But the interesting thing is that I've kind of realized that at least for my lower body, just because I'm not sore doesn't mean that it's recovered. And so I would often go into my leg sessions after four or five days and I'd be doing quads again and they wouldn't be sore. They would feel fine. As soon as I started training, I would feel like less motivation, less excitement in training the muscle group, as well as potentially just like fatigue that built up quicker. So maybe the first exercise would be fine, but then I would see a decrease in performance on the second exercise. And so giving myself that full week, seven days, I really felt like I went into each leg session super focused and fully recovered to the point that I could exert maximum intensity and effort into it. 
And I know you have been training with me for the last year and change where we've only been training legs once a week as well. And you've even discussed how your legs just kind of continue to, to move along and, and get results. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I would say that's probably the biggest realization. Nothing really on the upper body felt like super different than it usually would aside from maybe just slightly more volume on the day that really targets that muscle group. Yeah. Like you said, the frequency of hitting each muscle group was probably somewhat around the same in general when you kind of factor everything into it. Yeah. Was there anything that you would, would you run it again? Would you change anything next time you did it or anything like that? Yeah. So the second mesocycle, I actually cut a day out. It was six days a week uh, with arms and shoulders having separate days. And I, I just, throughout the end of that, that first mesocycle, I didn't want to train six days a week. It's just, it's just too many. I, I ended up writing the second mesocycle to smush the arm day and the delt day together into one day. And I actually did it in a density manner. This was even before I went to N1 hypertrophy camp, but in my brain, I was thinking that if I'm going to take these two days, I need to do more sets and set it up in a circuit fashion. So I had, you know, one bicep, one tricep and one delt movement. And I would do them as a circuit, getting three or four sets in really quick. And I had three different circuits like that. So that day actually ended up having 27 sets in it, wow. work sets or I don't know if it's total sets or work sets, whatever it was, it was 27 sets. And that's at least double what any other day had. And it took the same amount of time as my other days because of the way that it was structured and set up in this manner to increase density and kind of avoid overlap or competition between muscle groups. And so that was pretty cool. And I think that if I were to run it again, I would not do six days just because it just felt like too much. Uh, I think it was more psychologically than physically, but I just didn't want to be in the gym having to show up and have that sort of focus six days a week. Five was very manageable. Have you ever been this way where like in the past you like six days was like you wanted to train six, seven days a week, but now it's like, is that, is, has it, did that change for you over time or anything like that? Or have you, is it always kind of like, you know, you kind of get to that six days and it's kind of like too much for you. Cause I know for me, like I used to look like I wanted to train six, seven days a week. Now, you know, was my training intensity the same? Was execution the same? Probably not. But it's like, now I'm like, man, like I'm like you like five days. I think that's perfect. Anything more than that just seems like a lot, you know, to handle. I don't know if that's like increased responsibility outside of the gym or whatever that is uh, there with that. Yeah. You know, I think this is actually the first time in my life that I've ever tried to do a six times a week program. So I couldn't say if that's changed from my youth. My first years of training, I was on two to three times a week full body for probably the first three plus years. And then when I went to bro split training, it was never more than five days a week. It would always would have either like chest and triceps, back and biceps, and then shoulders would have their own day or else it would be that smush together kind of shoulder arm day type thing. Or I guess the other side of that could be you put shoulders and arms on separate days, but you do quads and hams together. So I think the the issue I had this time was it, it, I was trying to work too hard on each day. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like I needed a day, either a day off or I needed a day where I wasn't working as hard. And like even the way I designed your new mesocycle where the fifth day is just short overload stuff for the focus muscle groups, something like that even where I don't have to go in and really like get amped up for intense compound length and movements. And I'm just like, Hey, look, it's a day of isolation work. Most of it's short overloaded. I get some blood flow. I get in, I get out, not too much to worry about there. So yeah, there's a number of different ways I could tweak that. But I, I do think that for the reasons you said, like life circumstances, adding cardio in, which is another one. Like, I mean, even back in the day, I would just lift and then be a kid, like be a teenager, you know, as an adult, you have the responsibilities. Plus you have, you're getting older. You want to take care of your heart. You do some cardio, stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's a number of factors. Well, if you're smart, you want to make sure you take care of that stuff. Not everybody wants to necessarily do that, but cool. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's awesome. I wanted to hear how that went. So what about now? What's, what are things um, looking like now and kind of how do you have your uh, training set up uh, at this point? Yeah. So since we got back from Costa Rica, which was literally like a week and a half ago, I officially made the switch to cardio season. And that basically just means that I take my training volume in the gym and I am doing two full body workouts a week. The structure of it is alternating sequences. So I have, what was the day I just did? So part A was pendulum squat and seated leg curl alternated back and forth. Then I had a uh, incline cable chest press alternated with a rear delt pull down. And then I had face away curls alternated with dual cable lateral raise. And so that was one of my days. And then my other day is structured similarly. I think it's deadlifts alternated with tricep pushdowns, hang snatch high pulls alternated with uh, dumbbell fly press. And then 
The final part was currently escaping me. So yeah, I'm not 100% sure what the final part of that day was. But basically, three part A, B, and C, each one has an alternating sequence. The rep scheme is either four or five sets of five to eight reps. So I'm keeping the reps low, focusing a bit more on just maintaining my strength while I'm doing all this additional cardio. And then of those four to five sets, the first two to three sets are like building ramp up sets. And then there's two top sets for each movement where um the the big compounds like the deadlifts and stuff like that are around RPE seven. So, you know, three-ish, four-ish RIR, something like that. And that's probably just going to stay throughout. I'm not really going to try to escalate RIR and get closer to failure on a deadlift. And um, then the isolation movements are basically RP9 or one rep from failure across the board because I feel like there's not a lot of – like I, I do want to keep my upper body training somewhat intense – because biking is mostly lower body dominant anyway. So the little bit of lower body work I'm doing across three different movements, basically pendulum, leg curl, and deadlift uh, are going to be my movements, I think, for for the next few months. How how long are these these two weight training sessions taking you? With, with 60 to 75 minutes each. Gotcha. Yeah. I was wondering how, how that worked out with like the, you know, the, the, the circuit kind of style there with that. And then, like you said, five to eight reps. And like you said, mainly you're not, you just kind of want to maintain your strength. I mean, obviously you'll, you'll should still get some hypertrophy there with that, but the big thing is you didn't want to like add in, like, you don't want to do anything like, I guess over like 12 ish reps or anything like that is I'll probably just add a little bit extra fatigue potentially to cardio and, and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not like expecting to get hypertrophy or right. strength. I'm more just expecting to do the best that I can to maintain it. Yeah. I know that like I'm going to lose body weight because last year I ended bike season at 180, which is the lowest that I've been in years. And this year I'm starting, I started at 197 and already through a week and a half of prioritizing biking, I'm down to like 194, 195. And uh, that's just, I'm still eating. Like I'm eating all the food. I'm making sure to get all the calories is just you put in the work and, you know, my move tracker, which usually I set my goal at 700 calories a move per day. And that's pretty much what I hit throughout most of the winter each day. But once I get into bike season, that number is between like 1100 and 1600 most days. So it's a lot of extra caloric expenditure. Are you going to cut? Cause I know you used to do it where you'd like do like a cut at a certain time of year. Is you, are you kind of, I know you're not doing it for that, but are you kind of using this to like kind of replace that now at this point since you'll kind of naturally see your body weight trend down during this time? Yeah, exactly. That's what happened last year too. So I actually haven't done an official caloric deficit on purpose since spring of 22, was it? Yeah. Cause last year I biked and then this year I'm biking again. So that's actually really nice to not have to purposefully be hungry. You know, so it's like eat as much food as you can. And if you end up losing body weight, you lose body weight. Are you, could you, could you try more uh, if you want it? Or is it like, I, you just feel like you're eating as much as you can. And it's like your body weight, just because of how much you're expending through the the biking, it's just like, it's just going to trend down and kind of yeah. find that like, cap, that, that like, I guess, natural kind of settling point with the amount of activity you're doing. If I were to go with extremely palatable foods primarily and make most of my meals, like cheesesteaks, sandwiches and pizza and French fries, and most of the dessert, you know, brownies and cookies and ice cream. Like, yeah, I could certainly get more calories in, but no, I'm not going to be eating more like chicken, rice, and broccoli of <laughs> getting me up out of like the biking deficit. So yeah, I mean, I'm definitely having some of those palatable foods too. Like I would say during bike season, I'm able to eat eat out more often and you know what kind of oils those are cooked with or whatever, you're not really sure. And then, yeah, I will, I bake, I, I tend to bake a lot. Like I, I'm a baker. So I would say even, even throughout the year, I bake yeah, two ish times a week average. And if that makes a nine by 13 pan of banana cake or something, that banana cake is going to disappear in a few days. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, it's just part of who I am. I love it. So before we go on to the cardio side, what you're doing there, I'm just curious on some of your exercise selection there with that. So, you know, so de- like, so are you doing like conventional deadlift, like from the floor or, and, and, and if so, what what's, what's kind of the, the, rationale um behind that and everything yeah i'm doing deadlift from the floor because it works a ton of muscle which is exactly the reason that it's not a great hypertrophy movement but i i haven't done it in years and years and i messed around with it before costa rica just to kind of see what it felt like and i i used to be a really good deadlifter it was probably my best of the three power lifts back in the day i got up to a 525 pull with decent form 
And that was at under 200 pounds body weight. And so I just have always enjoyed deadlifting. And I feel like it's been so long since I've done it that I'm no longer emotionally tied to, you know, I can do a 455 triple or I can do 525 single. Like those numbers don't really mean anything to me at this point. And so I figured it's an opportunity for me to work a ton of muscle in there. And I'm actually in that setup of that day, the hang snatch high pull, which is probably another movement you're curious about yep. that that's actually in the part a section. And then the deadlift is in part B. Mm. And I feel like the reason to set it up that way is so that the hang snatch high pull kind of warms up that hip hinge. Cause as you hang snatch, you hip hinge down to about just above your knees. So it's almost like a snatch grip RDL to generate the momentum up through hip extension. And it was really cool. Like I, I man, I've really missed Olympic lifting. If I had a basement that was suitable to do Olympic lifting and it's not because the ceiling is too low, like I would, I would knock the ceiling with the barbell overhead. But if I could, I would probably be doing power snatch instead of hang snatch high pull because I, I really do miss that explosive power that comes with it. And I think that there's probably some transferability. I don't know what word that is. It's some transfer between uh, hang snatch high pull and biking in the engagement of working multiple muscle groups together to get up a hill or something along those lines. Plus it just kind of feels cool to be athletic. And if I'm not in a point where I'm trying to optimally pursue hypertrophy, then being able to throw in some of those that I've enjoyed that I feel like give me a little bit of joy. Yeah, exactly. Those are, those are movements that I kind of want to include. So I don't know if I'm going to keep the deadlift the entire time or not. If I start finding myself getting too emotionally attached to, you know, oh man, why is 365 feeling so heavy right now or something like that, then I'm probably going to ditch it and go to like an RDL or something along those lines. But for now it's been fun. And so I'll just keep it in there. And like the high pull, would, would that be kind of like, like you said, it's kind of more power explosive type movement, which is you probably haven't gotten a ton of that in with like your hypertrophy training. And I know that as you age, that's like one thing that like you really want to kind of try to maintain. It's not that you're old by any means, but you, you know what I mean there with that. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I do. I do want to try to include more explosive type work. Another one I used to love was really high box jumps and I can't do those in my basement either. So I think I may start including something like broad jumps and stuff like that too, just to, just to continue to work hip extension through explosive power and, and all of that stuff. Like anytime, you know, you go into hip extension, you're getting a bunch of glutes in there too, and hamstrings. So there is some carryover, not, you know, as the most optimal hypertrophy movement for those regions, but those regions are certainly getting some stimulus there. What's the rep ranges and stuff for the deadlifts and the high poles? Yeah, every, those two are five by five. But, okay. And so it's same idea. I'm just kind of doing three buildup sets. I think for the deadlift, I went like one, two, 25, 275, and then three forty five, something along those lines. And that felt pretty good. I definitely noticed fatigue in my bike ride that I did after the deadlift day. And I didn't love that. So I need to kind of rethink how I'm going to do like I, I, I planned to do an intensity day of climbing a hill after the deadlift day. And as soon as I got into the hill, maybe four minutes in, I could feel the fatigue through my whole posterior chain, like especially trying to bend over and be in that forward position on the bike. So I think that, you know, after the deadlift day, once every week or whatever, I just need to make sure that I don't plan an intensity day there. Maybe it's like a low zone two or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of trial and error and kind of see what how, how it fits in and everything like that. I, I would imagine your deadlift is probably going to go up pretty quickly here initially since you haven't done it for a while. I don't, I know you're not necessarily trying to do that, but I, it, I would think that it would go up decent, at least in the beginning as you're kind of like redoing that movement since it's been so long since you've done it. Yeah, you'd think so. But I also don't really want to push it yeah. in the sense that it's also a high propensity for injury. Right. And if you get injured from a deadlift, that actually is going to have direct impact on my ability to bike. So I am trying to be super prudent with that movement. And I feel like as we know through the literature, the lower reps and the compound movements that are really heavy, they just don't need to be close to failure to, yep. to see a bunch of results. So, so like, yeah, if I'm doing RPE six or seven sets and I'm like, oh, that was really easy this week, then sure, next week I'll go and add weight, but I'm not going to go into it kind of with that intention. Yeah. You're not going to go into it being like, Hey, I'm going to add five, 10 pounds each week. It's going to kind of be, Hey, this is how I'm feeling. You know, Hey, it's time to to add some weight. Cause it's, it's getting easier on um, yep. there with that. So yeah, no, that makes sense from a cardio perspective. What does that look like? What's, are you doing a race again at the end of this or what is, what was the, this look like from a cardio perspective? Yeah, we had a plan to all sign up for a race, me and some of my buddies, and then they haven't like officially backed out yet. 
but they're, they seem less interested in it. <laughs> it was a race that was scheduled for the end of September and I'm not sure if they're going to do it. And I don't know if I'm going to do it if they don't do it. I do want to do something to kind of give me the impetus to train for, but right now I'm not getting super focused on that. I'm more just trying to focus on the training and as the training improves and I feel like I'm ready for an event, I feel like I can sign up to one a little bit closer to the time. Maybe even I end up doing the same one we did last year and then compare and see. I don't know if the course would be the same, to be honest, but um, give me some sort of comparison amongst a similar uh, population of competitors. So yeah, not one on the horizon exactly. As far as training for, for right now, the weightlifting is twice a week and biking is five times a week. Eventually that may go up to six times a week, but right now I'm going to do five. And I'm going to try to take, I've been taking one off day. So yesterday I did nothing except walk. I didn't lift or bike. And then that means that one of the lifting sessions also has like a zone two ride on it. So I have a double day, one of the days. Uh, but the five sessions are essentially made up of one intensity session that involves going out and just climbing a mountain. So around here in Boulder, you've seen our beautiful mountains. I'll basically bike three miles to the mountain, and then I'm just going to choose one and just go for 45-ish minutes, plus or minus, and see where I end up, and then turn around and bike home. So that's one of the intensity days. In that day, I'll probably literally be at zone low zone five or high zone four for the entire 45 minutes. Yeah, it's gonna be awful. And that's actually what I'm planning to do today. So, so we'll see how that goes. And then another intensity day. I only have two intensity days. The other one is going to be not 100% sure. I'm going to kind of uh, oscillate between either something like tempo intervals, which are tempo would be right under your second threshold. So threshold is usually something you can do for 40 to 60 minutes at a time, but then you would be dead. Like you could not go longer than 40 to 60 minutes. But with this day, I would do 10 to 20 minute intervals at that pace. So the pace that I could do for an hour, I'll do 10 to 20 minutes with, you know, five minutes recovery between each. So that's one type of intervals I might do. And then the other time type would be VO2 max intervals, which you and I have discussed a bit about on here, uh, which would be somewhere between four and seven or eight minutes intervals at a time. And this pace would be above threshold. So it would be at a pace that I could not maintain for 40 to 60 minutes. Maybe I could maintain it for 10 minutes or 12 minutes, but I'm doing it for four to eight minutes. And then those have equal one-to-one -one work to rest. So it might be like six minutes on, six minutes off for four rounds or something along those lines. And those ones are obviously going to have your heart rate the highest because you're above threshold. So you're basically sitting in zone five for that entire interval and then kind of letting your heart rate come back down again. So those are the two intensity days. And then there's three lower intensity days. All three of those are going to be some level of zone two. So one of them, at least maybe two of them will be like low zone two. And then one of them will probably be a little bit higher zone two where I'm approaching getting into zone three, but trying to stay just below it. Gotcha. So, so three lower days and then, and then two higher intensity days there with that. Yeah. Those high intensity days, man, those sound, the, those sound rough, especially the, the, what was it? The one today that you're thinking about doing 45 to 60 minutes. And that's just sounds, climbing a hill. Yeah. Yeah. Just climbing a hill. What's the, what's the recovery like on that? You feel pretty beat up for the rest of the day there with that or. Yeah. You know, not so much the same day. I feel like these workouts that I do, especially like zone two, I feel great. Like, you know, how zone two is, but yeah. with the intensity stuff, I feel great. Most of the rest of the day, I do get a little bit of extra hunger, but I, I do feel pretty good. Usually that fatigue will hit me the next day. So I'll go to sleep and then I'll wake up and the next day I'll be like, Ooh, I feel a little bit fatigued, but it's not really soreness. Maybe it'll be soreness this first time. Cause I haven't done my mountain climb yet this year. So maybe tomorrow I'll be a little bit sore, but I think once, you know, repeated bout effect kicks in it's fatigue, but it's not necessarily soreness. Yeah. What was I going to say on, on the, the, the biking? Oh, so, so again, you're not, you know, again, you, you may have a race. You may not. So for you, is this just like. Again, you're just trying to like, you enjoy this and then it's just, Hey, obviously the, the heart health side of things as well too. Yeah. Is that kind of the, the main thing for you with, with kind of doing this cardio season? If, if you don't have, you know, if you're not going to be doing like a, a race or anything potentially at the end of it. Yeah. I'm really trying to blend the worlds of cardiovascular for health and longevity with cardiovascular for performance, because there are people on both extremes like on one extreme, you have the people that follow Peter Atia's advice almost verbatim, where it's four zone two sessions a week and then one higher intensity session. But then you have, th those are like just straight up health and longevity 
perspective or goals then the people that are straight up performance that are literally training to race, they're potentially putting in so many miles and so many hours that it might begin to border on the side of excessive cardiovascular work. And a lot of these guys that really have been cardiovascular athletes from a young age through middle age end up with AFib in their heart. And so it's not, it's not a, a cause of mortality. You're not going to really die from AFib in most cases, but it is something you do have to monitor and then be on top of. And so I'm trying to blend those worlds where I don't really want my biking to get over seven to 10 hours a week is kind of my sweet spot. And if I sit in there, I feel like I'm able to get the performance benefits and see increases weekly, monthly, whatever, while also getting the health benefits and not pushing myself into the extremes. Yeah. So, so kind of blending the two together. And then when you're done with this, will you go back to more like be focused on hypertrophy or that like TBD on yeah. that in terms of? Yeah, that's the goal. My goal is once bike season's over, call it like October, I'm going to probably get in contact with Mike Nelson again, who was my rowing coach last year and have him program me similarly rowing type stuff that we were doing before, which was three times a week, but only one of those three sessions was really, you know, psychologically, physically challenging. The other two were between 20 minutes of rowing, which pales in comparison to the amount of biking that I was doing. And so, so I think I'll probably get back on that train and make the rowing my cardio as we kind of get back into winter again and go back to training hypertrophy, likely with a, you know, four to five times a week type training program. Awesome. I uh, love, love hearing about your training and kind of your thought process behind it. So I know you went to the N1 hypertrophy camp a couple of weeks ago. Jordan was there too. And I know you guys did some pretty cool stuff there. So uh, maybe if we want to kind of dive into that a little bit and maybe how it's kind of, you've kind of hit it at it a little bit, but how it's maybe changed how you thought about hypertrophy or, or if it has or anything like that. Yeah. We did a few experiments as part of hypertrophy camp. So there was like a, a full lecture portion each day where Cass drops a ton of knowledge and there's a lot of like question and answer and back and forth and really cool intellectual conversation. But after, after the lecture portion around lunchtime, we would do a training session and sometimes a second one uh, later in the day as well. And in each of these training sessions, we would do some sort of kind of experimentation to assess how we perform in different situations and different circumstances. So for example, one of them, we did a comparison of resting two minutes between arm exercises versus resting three minutes between and whether that made a difference in reps achieved. And then we did one comparing leg extension to hack squat with a rest in between and then going back to leg extension and repeating that as kind of a circuit versus doing like all the sets of leg extension and then all the sets of hack squat. And then we did another one comparing doing lengthened partials length, how many lengthened exposures you get across a few different movements by doing, by comparing one and a quarter reps to just lengthened partials to full range of motion reps with partials at the end. And so given those two, those three different ways that you can train a movement, which one gives you the most lengthened exposures, so to speak, uh, on given exercises, you know, short overload versus lengthened overload movements and whether it makes a difference. And of course it does make a difference, but those were the three tests that I think really stood out in my mind and the lengthened versus short or the, the one I just mentioned regarding the partials and the lengthened exposures, that one showed pretty much across the board that one and a quarter reps gives you the most lengthened exposures than compared to any of the other two op the other two options I noted. As far as the other two tests that we did with the leg extension hack squat and then the arms with the rest in between, both of those demonstrated to me that increasing training density was beneficial. So that would be less rest, less resting between the arm movements. So two minutes of rest seemed to produce, oh, this is what it was. We two, it was two minutes of rest, but you did five sets versus three minutes of rest and you did four sets. Okay. And I found that on all across the board that the two minutes of rest with five sets was giving me more reps with given load. Got you. So okay. the extra rest was not beneficial essentially. And then on the one where we went leg extension to hack squat or all the leg extensions and then all the hack squats, we found that the leg extension to the hack squat produced generally better results when you look at total volume load achieved. And so- Part of that was because the hack squat has a much higher volume load. 
And so when you did all the leg extensions and then all the hack squats, you saw a less volume load on the hack squat specifically, but more volume load on the leg extension. But that didn't create more volume load overall because going leg extension to hack squat to leg extension to hack squat back and forth allowed you to have a higher volume load on the hack squat and a slightly lower volume load on the leg extension. Interesting. And any any particular reason why that would be, why you would get more volume load? Can you maybe explain that again, why you would get a little bit more volume load on the hack squat by doing it that way? Yeah, well, I think the better way of explaining it might be why you would get lower volume load on the hack squat doing it the other way. So if you do all four sets of your leg extension first, and then you go and do four sets of hack squat, you have all of that fatigue from the leg extension in your quads before you even begin your hack squats. Whereas if you go leg extension, hack squat, you've only got one set of leg extension in there when you go into your hack squat. I see. And then you go back to leg extension. And so your leg extension might suffer a little because you just did hack squat. But then again, you go to hack squat, but now you've only done two sets of leg extension and you're going to hack squat again. So instead of having four leg extension sets prior, you have one set prior, then two sets prior, then three sets prior. So ultimately your quads are a little bit more recovered, alternating it with leg extension to allow you to get more volume load on the hack squat. Okay. Yeah. That makes a little bit more sense. So you might be maybe like, like, so again, this could come down to like, Hey, what are you maybe trying to prioritize? So if it was like rec fin develop, development, then maybe you would want to hit that yeah. for like leg extension first or something like that. Like that could be a practical. Absolutely. Yeah. That. No. Re- yeah. I like that. Well said. Okay. So, so that's interesting. So does that, and we kind of talked about this earlier, does that change any, anything that you would like do in terms of programming? I know we kind of talked about like the practical limitation of that potentially. So again, in a perfect world, say that isn't, isn't a constraint. Would you maybe start to program that a little bit more for hypertrophy at at this point now then? Yeah, for sure. I I, I still am not at a point where I'm going to do it for my group programs because you just don't know what people's individual gym setups are like. And I've had way too many feedback across the years of well, like, I think it makes sense where I'm like, you can just bring your dumbbells over to the leg curl machine and you can do your leg curls and you can then do your dumbbell RDLs and you can just alternate those back and forth. And then people are like, well, my leg curl is upstairs and the dumbbells are downstairs. And I'm like, oh, didn't even like consider that that could be something that's happening, you know? So it really is tough because all gyms are set up differently. But yeah, in my own personal programming, I intend, like currently, I mean, if you look at the way my two times a week full body is set up, I'm, I'm, embracing some of those principles. But even as I get back into hypertrophy training, you know, in the fall, again, I assume that I will use those techniques in my home gym because it's just me in there, you know? And then, and then to go back to the the arm one. So again, you kind of increase your training density, like you talked about. So you did less rest, but you did add an extra set in there. And that, that kind of lines up, I feel like with what the research kind of says, where it's like, if you, if it's volume equated, it's like yeah, resting a little bit longer is going to be better. But if you can get a little less rest in there and you can get more volume and that's, it's should be fairly equal, but you guys found that, that from a volume load perspective, again, we need to clarify that. I feel like it was better to get, a, you know, do a little bit less rest. You're able to get more volume in essentially there with that. Yeah. I think the assumption was that given the way research is done, that four sets with three minutes of rest should have been equivalent to five sets with two minutes of rest because the total time spent is the same. Like you would expect volume load to be similar and it just wasn't. Uh, But I think that that is, it's important to remember that that is applied to single joint arm movements. And we're not talking about comparing five sets of a really hard compound movement to four sets and then shortening rest on that really hard compound movement just to get an extra set. I think you're dealing with a lot of fatigue factors that go beyond just local muscle fatigue. And now you're getting into like systemic fatigue, cardiovascular conditioning, psychological arousal, things like that. So, I mean, could you maybe, so for people that aren't familiar uh, with training density, could you maybe just like quickly describe like it in a, you know, yeah, simple way there, I guess. Yeah. It's doing more training in less time. Simple. So, but does that kind of go back to like, okay, maybe like doing a little bit more volume is kind of what we potentially need to look at doing here? Or like, if you can squeeze in a little bit more training volume in a, in, in a small, like a, a amount of time, again, obviously, like you said, this is for single joint yeah. stuff, yeah. isolation type exercises. Is that a good takeaway? Or is that, or am I maybe not interpreting that the right way? Yeah. I mean, I, given the state of the literature, I think that doing a little bit of extra volume on single joint, relatively low fatigue movements is a pretty safe play. Yeah. I, I, I think I I don't think in the end of the day that you're looking at drastic differences. A lot of this stuff we're still talking about, 
you know, how can I get there faster? Two people that train this way versus uh, the other way for 15 years are likely going to end up at the same place anyways. And so if you want to get there a little bit faster by increasing training density, or that's something that, you know, is enjoyable to you because it potentially can help you achieve a little bit of cardiovascular work into your weight training or something along those lines. Like there's a number of different reasons that I think it would be beneficial volume. Sure. Volume is a pretty safe play. I, I definitely wouldn't advise that necessarily for like compound movements. I, I wouldn't say that, you know, you're probably benefited by adding more volume in, even though the literature would probably say at this point that, you know, doing five sets of leg press is better than doing four sets, all things equal. I I think there's a lot of extenuating circumstances that go into that. Yeah. Can you recover? What's your intensity like as you get into that fifth set? You know, can you maintain yeah. that? You know, things like that. And then the, the length and exposure. I know because I think one of the things you mentioned was like, I think you guys did like a pull down, right? I know for you, you kind of, I think you tried to do some like in, integrated partials with like back work, but then you were kind of like, I don't feel like that works out very well, but it seems like you did it this time, right? And you, and it did give you a little bit more length and exposure by by doing it this way, or did, maybe you thought that that's what that was going to be the case. I don't know if I just misunderstood that or not. I think the one that I, the ones I said, I didn't think were going to be as productive on. So, so, oh man, I actually can't recollect exactly what you're referring to, but if I kind of just talk for a second about it, the movements that we were doing for this test for back, it was a short overload cable pull down compared to a lengthened overload on the prime machine, uh, prime pull down. And so on the short overload pull down, I got eight full reps and then five partials. So that gives me 13 lengthened exposures. And on the one and a quarter reps, I believe I did nine one and a quarter reps, which would give me 18 lengthened exposure. No, it was eight. It was eight. So 16 lengthened exposures. So it was a little bit better on that one. And then on the lengthened overloaded one, I got eight when they were full range of motion reps. And I think I did five of the one and a quarters. So that would give me 10 lengthened exposures. So eight versus eight. So on both movements across the board, it seemed that the one and a quarter provided more lengthened exposures. I think the one that I was saying, if I'm remembering correctly, that you might be referring to is I was saying that I didn't think that doing just lengthened partials on a lengthened movement was productive. And so we saw that in this example as well, because we did a lengthened, a 50% range of motion set. And on the short overload movement, I did a ton of reps because you're eliminating the hardest part of the movement. I can't even remember how many I got, but it was a ton. And then on the prime pull down that was already lengthened overloaded, I got the exact same amount of reps doing length and partials as I did doing full range of motion reps. So I got eight reps because it's so hard up at the top top and it's almost deloaded at the bottom of the rep. So it didn't matter. And that that's the same thing that you would see on like a hack squat or a back squat or an RDL or something like that. It's like, usually the weight that you're having to use actually kind of goes down because you're eliminating the easiest part of the movement, which is that little rest at the top. So that's where I think that may be productive if your movement is already lengthened overloaded to do lengthened partials, but there's still benefit potentially in doing one and a quarter reps. I see. Got you. Okay. That makes sense. Again, would you, would that change in any way you would program or anything like that? Yeah. I'm trying, I think I'm programming more one and a quarter reps now would be the end result of that. Like across my group programs, across, you know, my own hypertrophy programming in the fall, things like that. I think you've probably seen more of them in your training as well. And so, yeah, I think there's certainly benefit to that, assuming that lengthened exposures are a good thing. And I think based on the literature now, lengthened exposures do seem to be positive. So like, you know, I know one that, for example, you did for me was like the, I think it was an inclined chest press, dumbbell press last time. So again, that's going to be hardest at the bottom. So it's like, you don't, you wouldn't want to just do lengthen partials there. Mm-hmm. Cause like you said, you're going to end up having to decrease weight. Whereas instead you can, you know, do the full range, but it's now it's one and a half and you're still going to get all those lengthen that lengthen exposure in, in that one uh, there. Yeah, we actually did that test as well as part of this circuit with flat dumbbell bench press. And that was exactly what we found. The The flat dumbbell press, I got eight reps full range of motion. And I also got eight reps of just bottom partials. And then I did five of the one and a quarter reps. So I got 10 lengthened exposures uh, that way. Cool. Any Anything else uh, there that you that you took or were those kind of the main ones? Any Were any of those surprising to you or anything like that? Yeah, that's all the, the main ones that I really kind of took from that for the most part is the increase in training density mostly. 
and and the the length and exposures. I yeah, I don't really think there's a whole lot else to add. It was super productive, really enjoyable, and I highly recommend that anybody listening that wants to attend N one probably should go through the biomechanics course that that you went through first because the hypertrophy camp assumed that you'd already gone through the biomechanics and there was one person in our hypertrophy camp that had not, and they were like super lost. The whole- <laughs> That's funny. I actually, for me, I don't know how, if this is how it is for you, but like for a lot of these things, like I do have to kind of hear it a couple times. Right. So like I, I did the N one, the, the biomechanics course, and I kind of, I went through the whole thing and then I started to kind of watch some of the videos again, a second time before I went to the, the practical. And even then I still was kind of lost, but now that I went through the practical and watched it. I'm kind of rewatching some of the like anatomy and like some of the, the, how to, you know, execute the exercises and man, it just like clicks a lot more, you know, kind of watching it again. So all this stuff is starting to to make a lot more sense um, to me and I'm kind of getting it quicker. I don't know if that's the same for you where you kind of have to hear it a couple of times and each time you hear it, it's just different and things click there with that. Yeah. hundred percent, man. I mean, being around Cass and hearing him use this language, you know, a couple of times a year is, is super helpful. Like I was kind of telling you, even in that practical, like they, at the end, they, we, we did something where we, all the exercises we did, we had a, like, they, they gave us some muscle group and you're like, all right, tell, show me how to set up this exercise. And it's like, we just went through this, but like, even at the end, it was like all that information, there were still yeah. like exercises. I was like, shit, I don't, you know, I got to figure <laughs> out how to, how to do that. But anyway, so for my training, I wanted to kind of end on this going into a, a new training cycle here. And this is the first week for it. We talked about doing like lats, delts and triceps, just kind of want to hear your, your thoughts on it in terms of how you set it up. And there was anything that you kind of incorporated that we talked about today or anything new that you added in that you wanted to kind of test out. Yeah. So the way it's set up is five days a week. We have a lats, delts and triceps day on Monday. We have a lower body quad dominant day on Tuesday. Wednesday rest day, because that's your zone two day. And then Thursday, we do a full upper body day where there still is some work for lats, delts, and triceps, but there's also stuff for chest and biceps on there. And then uh, another lower body day that's hamstring focused. And the final day is kind of what I alluded to earlier, which is this short overload, mostly isolation movements for the upper body. And you haven't gotten to that day yet, but I'm really curious about your feedback for it once you do later this week, because that's kind of a combination when you ask about what things, you know, we might be seeing in your program that are from my learnings over this last month. I think that day is kind of an example of that where it's my, my version of trying to increase your training density. And we're not doing it a ton in circuit fashion because I know you're in a commercial gym and it is hard to hold down three or four machines at a time, but there is a decent amount of different exercises in there with some supersets and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I think, you know, that's probably the main thing that you'll see. Another difference in this cycle from our prior ones is we've always had one leg day in the prior ones. And so we have two now. Um, I just thought it would be kind of nice to change it up and you have a day that's basically mostly quads and a day that's basically mostly hams. And then there's like one movement for quads on the ham day and one for hams on the quad day uh, with some abs and some calves. So those days shouldn't be super daunting. I mean, you never go into a quad day and feel good about pendulum squats and right. split squats, but, but I mean, it, it should be better than having to do that and also do a bunch of hamstring work. So uh, yeah, those are my thoughts. What about you? What have you kind of gleaned from it as you look over it? Well, with the two leg days, you know, now my legs will be growing. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll get some <laughs> hypertrophy there. So no, but yeah, I mean, so far I, I know you kind of talked about the density. I know on the first day there was one where it was like behind the back cable laterals, Y rays and front raises. Is that kind of a way I guess to incorporate a little density as well in there? Yeah, hundred percent. That's was the other thing I wanted to mention. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah, so those three movements are kind of something I took away from the experience with Cass because they kind of, there's a little bit of crossover competition between them. But when you go from a dual cable lateral raise, which is a little bit of front delt because you're coming from behind the body, moving forward in that scapular plane. And then you go to a Y raise, which is also a little bit of lateral delt, but it's more on the posterior side because you're coming back across the body. And then you go into a front raise, which is again, more isolated to the front delt. And then I give you rest before you move back to the first one. I think that you can achieve a lot of quality volume in there for your delts, especially because the delts are a priority for us this cycle. And from your experience, the first day doing it, how did you feel about the the crossover fatigue that may or may not exist between those movements? I, I liked it. I mean, I, I felt like it was a nice way to kind of like 
just kind of keep moving. And like, I, you know, it's, I think it was like 30 to 30 ish to 60 ish seconds rest in between. So yeah. it was nice to kind of keep moving there. And like, I definitely, you know, I felt a good stimulus in my, in my all, all over my delts by, by doing that. And it definitely kind of sped up that, that part of the, of the workout. So yeah, I, I liked it a lot so far. That's the goal. And then I think there was a couple, I'm going to pull it up. I know one exercise that hasn't been in, like I haven't done these in forever. And I actually just thinking about these the other day is the upright rows. I haven't done those in, in a long time. That was one that I wanted to kind of ask you about. What was kind of the, the thought process behind that? And uh, yeah. I've actually always kind of been a fan of upright rows. They had a bit of a period of time where people were talking about them compromising the AC joint and the rotator cuff a little bit. But I feel like a lot of that is individually specific. Some people have shoulders that don't tolerate it, but even those ones that don't, it seems like if you pull it up to like lower chest, instead of all the way up under the chin, you can mitigate a lot of that. And then the goal of the lateral delts is to AB duct. And if you emulate a, an upright row with your arms, what's happening is the elbows are driving out. You're AB ducting, you're getting lateral delt stimulus, but it also has the additional benefit of getting you some traps and a little bit of upper back rear delt volume in there, which you don't get from a lateral raise, really. It's more isolated to the lateral delt. So I love the the benefit of that movement, especially on the cable. So I, I don't love it as much with dumbbells and barbells, even though I've used those a lot in the past. It has the same problem that dumbbell lateral raises do where you're just stacked against gravity at the bottom of the movement and there's no resistance. And so I love doing it with the cable, especially if you kind of like lean back a little and you almost let your arms like drift in front of you a little bit. You can keep tension on the delt pretty well at the bottom of the rep. So yeah, I, I, I've been a big fan of them. Something I have used in my own programming and program for my group programs too. And then, yeah, so you'll have to let me know how it goes. How have they in the past generally treated you? Good. I actually used to do them a pretty good amount back when I was like kind of, you know, really following like RP kind of style training because I know Dr. Mike freaking loves those. So I, I've liked them. I always thought they were great. I just haven't done them um, for a while. So I was just kind of curious to hear. So so again, that would be a that would be a short and overload for the for the delts and like the, the traps and everything like that because it's yeah. going to be tough as up here basically at the top. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I I'm looking forward. I haven't done those in a while. I think the other one too, that I had a question on was the one arm cable kickback. So I'm assuming yeah. that's, that's tricep. Those I have actually, like, I've never done any sort of like kickback um, there with that, but obviously again, that's going to be shortened overload there with that. So yeah, just kind of curious with that. And yeah, I mean, it's just another variation of ways to extend your elbow. I, I, I despise the kickback with dumbbells. It is the most worthless movement of all time because it is only hard in the short position and it's incredibly easy everywhere else throughout the entire range <laughs> of the motion. And so you end up sitting there using like a 15 pound dumbbell just because short is so hard and you get no stimulus anywhere else with the cable. I actually really like it. And I think that you could probably play around with exactly where you line up your body on the cable so that you can get a little bit more tension at the length and position too, but it should be pulling you forward. So you're, uh, you're going to have to resist that as the as you get to the the length and position you have to resist the cable pulling you forward which should stretch the uh, above the elbow on the lateral and medial tricep heads and then as you extend back it's it's going to be short overloaded because the strength curve is short in that our muscle gets weaker as we extend the arm but it should be relatively even resistance profile because it's a cable same as the upright rows. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, you may or may not like it. If you come to me and you say you hate it, we'll change it out for like a one arm cross body push down and like easy peasy. That's a great movement that we know is productive, but for the sake of variety and fun and trying new stuff, I think that, you know, there's certainly, as we know, in hypertrophy, there's benefit in targeting the muscles from different angles and stuff like that. And so this is something that you know, we haven't done, you probably have never, like you said, never done this. So maybe you get a little millimeter of tricep growth out of it. Who knows? Well, you know, and as you're saying this too, like, you know, part of like, obviously I, I hired you as my coach to, you know, help, like help offset me not having to worry about programming for myself and obviously your expertise around it. But part of it too, is, you know, like you adding in new exercises that I can potentially take and use with clients as well too, that I never, you know, would have thought about using. So, you know, I think that's part of it too, for, you know, anybody listening here with that. So I always appreciate, you know, 
adding in new things that we can potentially try. I, I love, I'm very routine driven, so I like having the same things, but it is nice to, to get some, some, you know, new things in there to potentially, like I said, try with, with clients and stuff like that. So yeah, cool. And then basically you said that, so like, I think from like, I know I, I would kind of want to on this ascending, descending pyramid sets for muscle growth. Like, are you adding some of that in this time or did you kind of uh, take some of that out? looks like kind of going through things, maybe not as much as there was uh, right. in, in the last uh, stuff like that. Yeah, there's a little bit of it, just kind of for simplicity's sake and keeping things organized over a five-day program. I think it makes a little more sense not to have so many moving parts. I think we do have it in there for, is it wide grip pulldowns on Tuesday? If I'm remembering correctly, we have one of those in there, descending maybe. I think that would be today. Actually. Or rather, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, maybe I did not. I, I went back and forth and oscillated on it, but I do like to use both ascending and descending sets. So the example being like you have a 12 to 15 reps first set, then a 10 to 12 second set, and then a six to 10 third set or something like that. I tend to use those more for like short overload isolation movements where you kind of can use the first set as a warm up, and then you increase from there and your last set is like this heavy one or whatever. And the thing I really like about that is that then I like programming a drop set in after the heavy set where you drop the weight back to the first weight and you you do that kind of from there. So you kind of get that stim, you get that continued stimulus across. And then with movements that are more compound or demanding, I tend to like to use the reverse pyramid where you would start, you would warm up first. So the nice thing about the isolation that I was just talking about is you don't have to warm up. You have your 12 to 15 rep set to three RIR. That's, That's your essentially warm your warm up set, right? But when you have, you know, the reverse pyramid for the compound movement, you got to do two or three warm up sets to get to your six rep set. And then from there you would drop the weight. So it's almost like top set back off set, but maybe there's even three of them in there where it's like top set back off set and then real back off set, like six to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 15 or something along those lines. And so I just find that works better because if I was doing a really heavy compound movement, I wouldn't want to try to hit my heaviest weight of that movement after doing 12 to 15 and then 10 to 12. I'd rather just build up to it, hit the top set and then get some benefit from the lighter back off sets after that. Yeah, that makes sense. That is actually something I've I've been meaning to ask you on that kind of the thought process on how you would go about that. But yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to like dumbbell bench press. You wouldn't want to do a super light set and then, and then go into your heavy set at the end there. You'd rather get that heavier set done first and then, and then kind of drop the weight um, from there potentially. So yeah, um, at least for uh, assessing and tracking metrics, you know, because it, because it's the problem I always had when I was younger and I would do these pyramid sets is I, I always was a big fan of 12, 10, 8, 6 back in the day. And I would do that for almost every movement. I didn't have any separation between lengthened and shortened movements. And the problem is that the 12, 10, 8 would exhaust me so much that I would never improve on my set of six. Yeah. And, I, and I'd think that I should be improving, but I wouldn't. So I'd be adding weight and then get worsening on reps <laughs> and not realizing how much fatigue was actually caused by those earlier sets. And so I just feel like for those big compound movements, it makes more sense to hit the heavy set and use that as your diagnostic tool and then back off and get the stimulus from there. Yeah. I, you know, when you started throwing in some of these, these pyramid sets like this, I was having the issue with clients if I didn't tell them. Like they would, you know, first of all, I, I started adding in the drop sets at the end too, which was like just a nice, just a nice way to like kind of change it up from just doing straight sets. But I ran into the issue where if I didn't tell some clients they would do the same weight, like for the 15 to 20. And I was like, wait, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta change the weight um, on that. <laughs> yeah. So just making sure if you implement these that you, that you do that. So, but again, another cool way to just kind of train a little bit differently. And with, like you said, hypertrophy, you know, we kind of have a variety of ways to, to train. You don't have to be like boxed into like, like one thing there. So cool, man. I know you want to get on your bike ride. So going to let you off the hook here with, with everything, uh, I guess, before I let you go anywhere, we want to lead the audience to, or anything coming up on your end that you want to uh, let anybody know about nothing too much. I guess we'll be starting a strength cycle at Paragon in like mid-May, something like that. So if you're interested in strength work and want to hit some barbell lifts, which you know we don't do too often throughout the year, uh, this would be a good time to do that. And then beyond that, yeah, man, appreciate the conversation. You can find me on Instagram and all the usual channels. All the usual stuff. Yep. Cool. Yeah. The strength, the strength program will be pretty cool. I'm assuming like sets of three, five, a little bit more of that type of stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We usually actually run it with a descending rep scheme. So it's like week one is sixes, week two is fives, week three is fours, and then all the way down so that we have a taper week. And then the final week is max out week. So everyone loves that. It's kind of cool to be able to see, 
you know, hey, I've been doing hypertrophy for the last 20 weeks since our prior strength cycle. And yet somehow I'm stronger on my barbell lifts. Oh my God. Like who would have thought? Yeah. It's like this constant problem I have where people are like, why aren't we deadlifting and back squatting and bench pressing? And I'm like, just trust the process. Like just wait until the next strength cycle and tell me what you think, you know, and then everyone PRs and they're like, oh my God, it worked, you know? Yep. Hey, the, the benefit of, of adding some muscle, you know, it, it, definitely carries over. So cool. Yeah. We'll make sure we put everything in the show notes there um, for that. And again, man, appreciate your time and we'll uh, shout with you next time. 